Thank you, everybody, for, for being here. We're uh, excited about this program, and thank you all for coming. And uh, Patrick, thank you for the nice welcome. Uh, if uh, everyone could turn your cell phones and electronic devices off, I'd appreciate that. This past summer, I was speaking at Arkansas Governor School. And one of the questions that was posed to the soon-to-be high school seniors was, is there a substance abuse problem epidemic in your high schools? And two-thirds of the students from all over the state raised their hands. And that was a major awakening for me, Ryan, to realize that um, that problem was not, quote, somewhere else. Uh, and it was interesting to uh, see their reaction. When Ryan left the Clinton White House in 2001, he had no idea that a few years later he would face the challenges of addiction, of homelessness, uh, of loneliness, uh, and uh, something that was hard for him to imagine as he was a young White House staffer. But not long after that, I think it was in February 2005, 2015, 2015, that uh, he began his recovery. And in a short time, this remarkable young man has become perhaps the leading national voice for addiction recovery, uh, drawing interest and support from all over the world. His story not only is powerful, but it is life-changing and life-saving. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ryan Hampton to the Clinton School. All right. Tell us a little bit about uh, your addiction story. Uh, how did you become addicted? When? How did it lead to heroin? Uh, just that sure. Would be uh, I'm incredibly grateful to be here, first of all. Uh, thank you to the Clinton School uh, for welcoming me. And before I want to get before I get started, I just want to say uh, I had the opportunity to meet with some students uh, just now and hear their stories. Thank you for that introduction and for uh, recovering out loud, Patrick. Um, it inspires me. Um, you know, and Andrew is in this room here. Andrew, thank you for sharing your story. Um, I get to hear these stories uh, on a daily basis. Uh, Andrew's a student here. Um, but Andrew, uh, December 2016, lost his brother to an overdose, um, and he's getting more and more involved in this space uh, to make an impact. So thank you for doing that. Um, so a little bit about me, uh, very simply. I mean, my addiction story isn't uh, that unique. Um, my recovery story is, but just to qualify for a second, um, I you know, grew up in Miami, Florida. Uh, I was a good student. I was always interested in politics. Uh, I was kind of a weird student. Uh, when other kids would go to football and, and intramural sports, I was uh, actually 25 years ago today, Skip, I was counting electoral votes as a 12-year-old as Bill Clinton was winning the election. So yes, that was the kind of kid I was. Um, and as a result of that, you know, took on internships and public service was something I was always very interested in. Uh, had an opportunity to work uh, as an intern for President Clinton in 96. Um, Skip mentioned I went on to, as, as very young, as a very young man, uh, at 19 took a job uh, working at the White House after the administration was over. And, and, and throughout this time, you know, just for full disclosure, I mean, I was, I had dabbed in drugs, I, I think as, as a lot of uh, kids in college do. I had experimented with marijuana, I was drinking, um, you know, I had some, you know, inklings of, of there might be a problem uh, when I was in high school. But I was also a product of just say no. <laughs> um, I didn't like to talk about these things very publicly. I mean, my mom's here today too. I, I think she can attest that 
you know, during that time and period um, in the 90s and early 2000s, not many people wanted to talk about it. Um, certainly if you were suffering. In 2003, I was at the, if, if any of you know DC, I was hiking at the Billy Goat Trail and I broke my ankle. Uh, walked into an urgent care clinic and uh, was prescribed a, a very high grade opioid called hydromorphone, also known as Dilaudid. Um, it was suggested that I get a MRI done, um, which I never did, uh, but what I did do is go back to that same doctor um, and got another prescription. Um, that continued uh, for the better part of that year, uh, and I had since then had moved to Florida. If you know anything about Florida in the mid-2000s, uh, massive sea change going on in terms of conventional medicine. I got hooked up with pain clinics. Um, make a very long story very short, uh, a nightmare of several years uh, on pain pills till one day I showed up at a doctor's office. Uh, my name had been put in a PD, what's called a PDMP, uh, which is a database uh, for people who use opioids. And I was told, no more scripts for you. You're abusing your drugs. Uh, if you show up at a doctor's office, I was literally told if I showed up at a doctor's office for another script, I'd be arrested. Uh, this was after a good six or seven years of heavy opioid use. Uh, the decision from a White House, former White House staffer, uh, guy who had a real interest in politics, uh, had a career at one point, uh, it took about a split second for me to make the decision that I needed to start using street heroin. Uh, I could not function without my drug. Um, I am fortunate enough uh, that I did not become a statistic, uh, you know, one of the 175 that we hear about daily. Um, I'm incredibly grateful for that. I'm also incredibly grateful that on February 2nd, 2015, uh, I entered into recovery. Um, and it was not easy. Um, I had been through treatment centers before, uh, but this last time it was like gnawing my way there. Uh, I was on my way out from being kicked out of, you know, my last apartment. Uh, I was facing homelessness once again. Um, there was just no resources for me. Um, I went to a public treatment center. Um, I was detoxed off of methadone very quickly, uh, using methadone very quickly. Um, and because of luck and because my family supported me um, and because of a partial scholarship from a treatment center, I was able to get into treatment. So that's how I found recovery. That's how I found treatment. Um, but recovery for me really started February 2nd, 2015. So Ryan, one of the courses we teach at the Clinton School is advocacy. Mm. And shortly after you got sober, you jumped right into advocacy. What led you to move from addiction to sobriety to becoming a vocal uh, advocate for, for recovery efforts? It's, a, a, it's interesting. Um, I certainly didn't see myself as, as certainly sitting here at the Clinton School talking about this today. Uh, and it is kind of tragic. Um, I was very quiet about my recovery, very quiet about my struggle for the first uh, several months into early recovery, actually leading up uh, my first six months, I'd say. I went home for Thanksgiving to see my mom for the first time um, February, I'm not, not February, uh, November of 2015. Um, there was a, a friend of mine, his name was Greg Samuel, uh, who I entered into treatment with. We were basically roommates. Uh, Greg and I went to stay at the same sober living afterwards. And mind you, I had been an active user for over a decade. I could probably remember one or two people that died that I was not close to during my active use. Um, it may be because I wasn't paying attention. It may be because, you know, fentanyl has entered into the mainstream. I don't know. Um, but what I do know is I got back from Florida, I can remember that Monday night uh, after having this great you know, time and spending it with my family and uh, opened up my Facebook app and Greg was dead. And um, you know, he died of an overdose and it impacted me greatly. Um, but it wasn't just Greg's death, it was a couple weeks later, a guy who was actually my roommate in sober living, his name was Nick, 
Um, and I was, at this point, I had like graduated to a level of responsibility at my sober living. I was managing it, which is just insane. They were letting me manage a house with all these guys. Um, but I took a lot of responsibility in it. Uh, Nick showed up. Nick had a recurrence of use. He was uh, back on heroin. Um, he needed help. Uh, my friend Garrett and I sat with him for about two hours that night. We said, listen, Nick, you got to get help, man. Like, you got to you gotta go. He's like, but I have no money. I have no insurance. You know, I, I, I don't even know if I have Medicaid. Um, and I need a place to sleep. And I'm like, well, you know, unfortunately, the way the system is set up today, like, I had to advise him, go to the hospital. Um, tell them you have a problem. You know, they can help you. There's doctors there. Um, go to the hospital, tell them you're, 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 you're worried, something's gonna happen, uh, you need help, you don't know what to do. So he did, it was about midnight that night, Nick goes to the hospital, to the ER room, about three miles from my house, Huntington Hospital, he goes into the ER room, he tells them he's got a problem, um, they deal with it as they do with addiction, as an acute problem. Um, he was discharged two hours later, uh, that was the last I heard from him. Uh, we found, you know, his body was found about a mile away from our house the next morning. So that angered me to my core. It shook me to my core. And I just realized something was wrong with how we deal with addiction in America. And I didn't know the policies. I didn't know that there was a movement of people out there that were working to break stigma and look for solutions. But what I did see is it, Garrett and I had seen this film, The Anonymous People, and we had heard about uh, this movement. I want to show the clip of it real quick because it was, it, it was this, it, it's a longer film, but this is like a, I don't know, like a one, one and a half minute teaser to it. But if you understand politics, if you understand social movements, um, and you see something like this in your recovery, you'll understand probably why we started doing what we do. As a person in long-term recovery from an illness that has no cure, but an illness that has a solution. I would not be standing here today, continue bettering myself as a man, as a father, owning a home. Everything that recovery has given me today, I got it. So now it's my turn to teach you that recovery works. have a group of people who are one of the humblest people I've ever met on this earth, but their spirits are, are strong. You can feel the spirit of that person yearning for recovery, and you can feel that same spirit when people have totally internalized and embraced this whole recovery program. It's like a light shining inside of people. We laid the groundwork. The voices are out there. We have the science, we have the data. We have to find and open the hearts. And I think those hearts want to be open. I absolutely believe it. If we were to be the face of Voice of Recovery and go tell our story, tell it every chance we got to everybody we came in touch with, we can reverse probably at least 50% of those people make believers out. We're not gonna get everybody to believe. That'll never happen. But by God, we can turn half of them around. Because those same people did not believe that a woman should vote. And if you go further back in history, the same people didn't believe that a black person should vote or be a citizen. So as, as history goes by, history's on our side. History will show one day who and what we are. So I say we make history. That's what I say. I see this, um, just to follow up, and I'm like, where are these people? I have to find them. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I, I can feel it. I feel this deep sense of social injustice, right? My friends keep dying. Uh, I, I, I got to get out there. I got to tell my story. Um, so that's what I did. I didn't know them. 
I knew they existed. Uh, I stalked them on Facebook. Um, they got back in touch with me and they basically welcomed me with open arms. They said, this is what we're all about. We need to connect with as many people as possible. We need to inspire the next generation of advocates and activists uh, because while addiction and recovery at its core is a very personal thing, and I get that, my personal recovery is personal, it is not political. I just wanna make that clear. My personal recovery is not political. But addiction recovery as an issue is highly political. Um, and I wanted to make it my purpose to get involved on that side of it. Okay, so you took this on as a cause. How did you, and again, in the spirit of advocacy being taught here, how did you turn this into not only a visible national movement uh, in the recovery world, but, but with the national media and, and, and bringing attention to this, how did you do that? It wasn't easy. Um, <laughs> getting people to listen to you in early recovery is never easy. Um, but what I did is I, you know, a year ago, actually, I was on a flight back from New Hampshire. The election had just uh, ended. Um, you know, Hillary had lost, Trump had won, and I was devastated because I was in New Hampshire talking about uh, addiction and, o and <laughs> the opioid crisis. And I'm sitting on the flight, and I'm like, how, how did this happen? How, how did this happen? I mean, I don't care who you voted for. This is just my personal feeling. I was like, I can't believe this happened. Um, and I'm thinking, and I'm on this long flight, and I'm, you know, bawling half the way back to L.A., and I'm like, social media. I mean, clearly, social media had a, a big part in that. Um, and so when I got back to LA, I looked at Garrett and Garrett's watching on the live stream. So hi Garrett. Um, <laughs> I got back, I looked at Garrett and said, we're going to, we're going to start taking on social media. Like why hasn't this movement looked at social media? So we built a Facebook page and I built a Twitter and an Instagram. And, um, I was like, well, what are we going to put on it? You know, people, I'm not just going to keep reposting everybody's content. So, well, let's just start telling, I mean, what got me involved? I told my story for the first time. That's what inspired me to take that next step into advocacy and got me actually really excited because of the result of people reaching out to me, wanting to support me, not just in my recovery, but in what I was doing. I said, so what if I could recreate that same experience, that same funnel for as many people as possible? Sans any type of ads or other motives than just having people go out and tell their stories for impact. As we started to do that, we were getting hundreds and hundreds of submissions. Uh, we'd put people's stories up. They'd call me the next day or they'd email me. They'd say, how do I get involved with the next step? Um, we now highlight stories of people um, that are involved in particular issues. You know, one thing is, is you may not, I, I, somebody could throw you data and science all day long as to why treatment should be more accessible, as to why certain MAT components should be there, as to why jail programs, I'll show you a clip in a second, uh, you know, should exist. And I could sit here and throw all that data to you all day long. I could talk to you about recidivism rates. <laughs> I could talk to you about treatment outcomes. I could talk to you about why we need recovery supports. But for some reason, people don't relate to that, right? I mean, we've been talking about this stuff for a long time. People just don't relate to it. It doesn't, that content doesn't cut through. So what if we could just tell those stories of people who are actually involved in that work or who have come out on the other side and somebody sits there and they're like, hey, you know, whatever that guy's doing, it seems to be working for him. How do we get that in my community? And that's really how it blew up. Na national media, a whole nother ball game. I mean, I think anybody who has a story to tell, um, especially when it comes to this issue right now, is the time to be telling it. Uh, I'll just tell you personally what I did because um, I got really ambitious in terms of, you know, making a way for us at their table. I researched all the opioid articles that had been written by all the major dailies for about two weeks. Um, I went back and saw what reporters in different markets were reporting on this stuff. I had realized that as a unified movement, we had no coordinated press list, you know, or press efforts, media efforts or outreach. I started talking to other, I guess you could call them talking heads, I said, hey, let's coordinate messages. And then I just started calling, the, I've been calling these reporters for a year now, just offering my own lived experience. I didn't appear in a lot of articles. I just kind of helped drive the conversation. Because what I've also found, 
is that the media is incredibly uneducated about people in recovery. I mean, incredibly uneducated. One of the things that drives me insane is when you see this great story of hope, this great story of success and recovery, and the headline image is like a spoon in a cooker. You know, I mean, it just re-emphasizes the negative stigma that we carry along. So I've tried to educate them um, in my own personal way, but what I've found is that that is part of building a relationship with them. I encourage anybody who's here uh, who has a story to tell, talk to your media, local, national. They need to hear from you. You uh, traveled America. I you did. went to uh, the hardest hit states. Um, can you tell about it? How you put that together? Why you did it? The states you chose, and what kind of impact it had? Sure. Uh, you know, after Greg died and Nick died, and that those first four months, it was about six of our friends who died. Um, I had been disconnected from politics and public service and organizing and all of that for a better part of a decade. Um, I had linked up with a nonprofit called Facing Addiction, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but I'm reading through the Sacramento Bee uh, one early morning in April. I don't smoke anymore, but I was a smoker at the time, and I used to sit on this on this porch and smoke cigarettes at like 6 a.m. in the morning and read the headlines and uh, mostly about the election at the time. And I came across an article. It said, delegates for the Democratic National Convention, uh, you can, anybody can register to be a delegate. Um, you know, you just have to register with your party and you have to be a registered voter. And then it went on to say that uh, it was easier to get admitted to Harvard <laughs> than to become an elected delegate to the DNC. So I was like sold. Um, <laughs> that I was going to do this. I've always wanted to go to Harvard, so this was the next best thing for me. Um, and I looked at my, my buddy Garrett, and I said, okay, we're going to do this. And he's like, but Ryan, you're not even a registered voter in California. So well, we can fix that today. You know, We're, we're going to go down. I'm going I'm to register to vote. Uh, registered to vote, came to find out that there were 70-some-odd candidates. I had never been to a caucus election before. I had no idea how big of a deal it was, um, but I wanted to have an edge, and I still had some, you know, I still had some of that organizing talent from back in the Clinton days. I know you needed to, you know, get people registered to vote. I know you needed to organize them. I know you needed to feed them breakfast on the morning of the election if you were going to get them there. All things I remembered, so that's what I did. I went, um, Sober living to sober living, treatment center to treatment center. Uh, median age was probably 22 years old. Probably 80% of them weren't registered to vote. Interesting fact, of that 80%, probably 50% of them didn't even think they could vote because they had some sort of conviction in their past, um, which was didn't prevent them from voting, but they just that's what they thought because that's what they had heard. So we registered about 70 people. Um, they all showed up on caucus day. Uh, we all rode over to the voting site and um, there were maybe 600 some odd people lined around this corner. Everybody's out with their buttons and their bumper stickers and t-shirts. I had no idea it was this big of a deal. Uh, and here I was with like my halfway house crew um, <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, this is embarrassing, but we're going to go through with it anyway. Uh, we don't have any flyers. I said, but what if we just kind of like fan out with this line and start telling people why we're doing this? Let's like, let's share our stories. Let's like get out there in the community. And that's what we did. I went, you know, person to person and told them about how I'd lost friends, how I was, you know, in recovery from heroin. My friends did the same thing. And, um, what I realized though, that really was powerful to me was that all these people in this line, I'd say one out of three, they also had a story to tell um, that they hadn't talked about. A grandmother who had lost her granddaughter a couple months prior to an opioid overdose, a woman who grew up in an alcoholic household, another woman whose brother was in treatment at the time. And it was almost as if they were waiting for these 20-somethings to show up and invite them to the conversation. Um, long story short, we won. Uh, I like to say we because it was like a lot of us, um, but I ended up going to the convention and that took us on this cross country trip. Um, it was 22, about 22 states, 8,000 miles in 30 days. Um, 
you know, and that was actually something that Garrett and I decided to do after we won the election. We had no, we had not planned on it, but as this journey was, that happened. And I was like, okay, well, what's next? Like, how do we keep, the, how do we keep the momentum going? How do we keep getting this message out here? I said, well, I know what we'll do. We'll, we'll get in an RV and we'll travel the country and we'll put it all on video and we'll throw it up on YouTube. And our partners at Facing Addiction are like, hey, Ryan, you know, that's going to cost a lot of money. I said, no, 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 no. I live in LA. I got it. I got this. Like, I, and I worked my own recovery community and we found a producer and we found a director and we found an editor and we found a cinematographer, um, all who did it practically for nothing. We all traveled together um, and we threw them up on YouTube. Um, some of them went viral. And I'm going to, the, the most important one to me, though, that really, um, changed my perception on criminal justice uh, that did go viral. I want to show it. It's like seven minutes. Um, here we go. Chesterfield, Virginia. My greatest fear is dying due to my addiction. Not being able to live out my purpose that God really you know, intended for me to you know, fulfill. My greatest regret is picking up the first time and then uh, Picking up the first time and continuing to go back. The insanity of it, knowing that the more I use, the sicker I get when I was already sick. So just going back, using more, and getting even sicker, and just continuing the addiction. Just continuing the addiction. Carl Leonard. Sheriff, Carl Chesterfield Leonard, County, Virginia. Sheriff, Chesterfield County. The definition of insanity definition is of doing insanity. the same thing over and over and over again, over expecting different results. Over over again, We've been arresting people for heroin use for decades, and it's not made a difference. And I'm just tired of it. I'm tired of seeing these people come in. They get no treatment. They, they come sober, and they get released, and they go right back to using the drug. I want to stop the deaths. And to do that, we've got to break the addiction. I've been in jail over. Four the time since I was 13, all due to heroin addiction. I wouldn't have went to jail if it wasn't for the disease. The disease is sitting lie to me and tell me that everything I'm doing the right thing, how me doing things that I really don't want to do. The disease of addiction is a very easy illness to target for a correction industry. They know 97% of the people who use are going to relapse and use again. So. Our system, whether it was deliberately or inadvertently, has been built around the chronicity of addiction. It's a chronic illness. The chronicity plays out in our courtrooms, in our probation offices, in our jails, and in our prisons, and in our communities. So instead of addressing the chronicity part of our illness, our system, our culture addressed the public safety side of it. That's why we have such a large revolving door. History has clearly shown that when you treat addiction as an illness, you actually get a measurable outcome with recovery. HARP is our heroin addiction recovery program. It's uh, an intensive program. It's probably 12 to 15 hours a day that they work at this. Uh, it includes peer-to-peer, -peer, which is the biggest component of this. Uh, I bring in licensed doctors and psychologists and, and social workers, addiction specialists, and they can spend hours in here, and, and they have some benefit. But when you can relate to somebody who's in there counseling you because they've been there, they've been an addict, they've been in jail, they've made the recovery, they, they receive that a lot better, and that's one of our biggest things. Once they get released, either by posting bond or bail or serving their time, we allow them to continue to come into the jail every day to continue to participate in these programs. One of the things we've told them is, once you get released, if you ever feel yourself going back to that dope deal, if you ever feel yourself that urge to shoot up again, come back to jail. Two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. Come here, everyone in this group in HARP has agreed, let us wake them up and they'll be their peer. They'll get them through that tough spot. What do I tell you all? What's the only difference between everybody in these walls and everybody on the other side of the wall? Right turn and left turn. It's one decision in your life brought you here. I made a different decision than you all. Now, we're going to give you the tools and the skills and the ability to make this decision. So the next time you're confronted with that decision to do that dope, you know, you won't. Uh, you know, I appreciate what you're doing. I believe in you.
Uh, if I didn't believe in you, I wouldn't be in here every day, guys. I really wouldn't. They started treating us, stop just throwing us away behind him in the box. So it's no problem. We just get better at what we're doing. We want to treat our addiction, their disease. I got a year for a violation for dirty doing. When, when I got accepted to a program, the judge rather give me a year in concentration. I'm only 22 years old and I've been using for a long time. You're going from locked up to the streets and it's overwhelming. And we go to what we do best and that's using. My mother, my mother is 53 years old. My father just died in prison. My mother's doing three and a half years and I'm currently doing 18 months. Our job is to show that this is bigger than a public safety issue. This is a health care issue, a health issue. So when we get a politician to go out on a limb for us, we have got to make sure we protect that resource. And in this case, that protection looks like active recovery while you're here and once we turn to our community. If you want to see more of this from more politicians across the country, we need to show it. We have got to be facing the voices of recovery, active recovery. We cannot be in the shadows we cannot return to the lives we came for. We got to be better than that. I've been incarcerated more than four times, and this is the most unique um, program I've ever seen. And what makes what's made it so successful in its infancy is the sheriff of Chesterfield County, Carl Leonard, has been so aggressive with this uh, issue. And this, I challenge every sheriff's office of every little county from Podunk, Mississippi to New York to everywhere um, to take an aggressive approach as well. These folks are given some privileges. Uh, they're allowed to self-govern, self-rule, and they do a fantastic job of taking care of themselves. They have such great responsibility. Uh, I could trust them to run this entire program by themselves and give them the key to the jail and I wouldn't have to worry about anything. Now, I would never do that, and I won't tell them that, but they're very trustworthy, and, and, and you can just see in them, they're invested. Again, they want this addiction to go away more than anybody. I am motivated by these individuals, and they inspire me every day. It's worth investing in them. They are valuable assets to our community and society, uh, and anybody who thinks otherwise is, is wrong. Just as a quick follow-up to that, um, that sheriff, that Sheriff Paul Leonard in Chesterfield County, Virginia, now you wouldn't know it uh, because it's probably the most progressive forward-thinking program I've seen uh, for people with substance use disorders, but Sheriff Leonard is a elected Republican sheriff in rural Virginia, Chesterfield County, Virginia. Uh, he was a Trump supporter. and. Um, he said he was just sick of people dying. He was sick of seeing the same people come in and out. He said, so I need to, I need to try something different. He partnered up with uh, the gentleman you saw there is John Schinholzer of the McShin Foundation, which is a nonprofit. It's a recovery community organization in Richmond. And the sheriff called John and said, I got to do something different. John said, we have a peer-to-peer, -peer, authentic peer-to-peer -peer support program. We can get it set up in 24 hours. Sheriff said, well, how much, I can't get any money for this. I can't get money from the feds. I can't get money from the state. I can't get money from the county. How are we gonna fund it? He says, well, Sheriff, 
I, we can do this program. Literally, it will cost you $790 per inmate per year, per year, okay, to get them authentic peer-to-peer -peer support services. Now, Stacia Murthy, who was in that first video we just showed you, she said, we have all the science, we've got all the data, now what we need to do is open up the hearts and the minds. This storytelling, thank you, this storytelling is not just for YouTube videos or Facebook or anything, it's to open up people's hearts and minds. As a result of that video and working with the sheriff and working with that RCO, um, Vir the Virginia legislature actually last year um, approved four pilot programs based off of this model, uh, which they first learned about last year uh, because of the work that we did together around this. Um, and then based on the data they get from those four programs, they're gonna implement it statewide. Um, we need to see this in every city and town across the United States. So you mentioned it earlier and I was gonna ask you about it, uh, facing addiction. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the national advocacy organization and nonprofit that, that you have uh, championed. Uh, and it has grown to be obviously the, the largest, I believe, in the country. Uh, can you tell us about it um, and, and how that transpired and where is it going? Sure, so Facing Addiction, um, it is the nation's largest advocacy, activism, nonprofit in the addiction recovery space. Um, the way that I was led to it and why I am so passionate about it uh, is they gave me a voice, right? A everything that I've learned to do today, uh, I kind of stand on the, the shoulders of a lot of giants uh, that have spent their life uh, working on this. It's founded by a gentleman by the name of Jim Hood. Uh, Jim lost his uh, oldest boy, Austin, five years ago um, to an opioid overdose, and he left his career. Uh, he left what he had known his entire life uh, to dedicate his life to uh, finding solutions. He partnered up with Greg Williams, who actually was the creator of the Anonymous People, um, who is a, a, a big recovery guy, um, and they make a, a very dynamic uh, partnership. Uh, Greg provides kind of a lot of the, the, the recovery side of the work. Uh, Jim provides kind of on the other side of that, the prevention and the branding. I mean, he comes from a corporate branding background, so it's this fascinating relationship. But in two years, because the organization's only two years old, they've grown. I mean, the President's Commission on Opioids um, had a public opening for comment on the interim report. Uh, the final report was just released on Wednesday. To give you an idea of how impactful unifying our voices can be, they asked for public comment. Uh, about 7,000 people from in the, around the United States uh, provided public comment. There, were no, there was no mention, not even recovery sports, there was no mention, the word recovery didn't show up in the interim report once. Not once. And it outraged us. So Facing Addiction organized this massive letter campaign. We said, we need people from all over the nation to write why recovery supports need to be recommended in this report. And over three weeks, we collected over 15,000 testimonies. 15,000. Submitted them to the commission. And I think uh, a big outcome of that was the final report that was issued on Wednesday had massive recommendations for recovery. I have found that it's not that our policy makers are making bad decisions, it's that how can we expect them to make good decisions without us involved in the conversation, right? Um, and so we have to take it upon ourselves to fight our way into those conversations, to make room for us at the t those tables, sharp elbows, whatever it takes, um, because Good policy comes from that. So, when you were visiting with our students before we uh, over lunch, before coming out here, you you cited a statistic. Oh yeah. That that that, and then I want to pivot from that into knowing that what are the challenges we face given where you know given the landscape today and where we are. But the statistic, would you mind repeating that? Yeah, it, it is a fascinating statistic. In 2016, according to the CDC numbers, more people actually took an opioid 
um, took an opioid in the United States than voted in the presidential election. So more people were taking opioids than actually voted in our presidential election. Um, it, it is a problem um, you know, that, that we need to realize is here. And it's not just, I do want to follow it up with though, it, it is not just an opioid problem. We have a massive addiction crisis that includes alcohol, that includes other drugs. And it's important that within the narrative of this opioid crisis that we recognize uh, that there's a lot more going on that needs to be dealt with than just opioids and, and treatment for opioids. So if you talk about the challenges faces, let's talk about some of that. So, and we can, and then we can dovetail into, uh, again, as you say, uh, uh, the recovery is, is, is I mean, and the issues mm -hmm. are, are not, are beyond personal that, that the solutions are crossover into political. Mm -hmm. so, so what are the big challenges out there for people who are um, hoping for, needing, uh, being educated about recovery? I know, and I'm not minimizing the challenge, I know there's been a great emphasis on, you know, how we reduce prescription drugs and opioids and all that, but, but, but what are the challenges facing people who are, who are you know, because there's probably hundreds of thousands out there in hopes of, re of recovery. And then if you would pivot into that and then talk about, and I really am not totally familiar with other than just hearing about the president declaring the, the, the opioid issue and what, from that, what does that mean and what, what does that mean for Congress? Sure, I mean, I think, so there's a couple of ways to answer that question. Um, in terms of the challenges as, an issue um, to keep people alive. So I'll address it that way first. Uh, we, I think as a country, uh, have missed the mark on this continuously. Um, and that's a result of us not being at the table, right? Um, I had been through treatment more times than I care to remember. I had been through multiple <clears throat> detoxes. The 12 or so friends that I've lost um, in the last year and a half, all been through treatment all been through detox. We continuously and continue to deal with addiction as a chronic, I'm sorry, as an acute problem with an acute solution. Uh, it is not dealed as a, dealt with as a, as a chronic illness. Um, Surgeon General Murthy, our former Surgeon General, issued the first ever uh, report Surgeon General's report on alcohol, drug, drugs, and health last year, November 2016. In the report, in the science, in the data, which is well known, uh, it states that year one is obviously the hardest, which we all know, but after year five, uh, your risk of a recurrence of use, which is also known as a relapse, drops below 15%. So knowing this, why are we not investing and in looking at those first five years? Right? Why are we only putting people through treatment for 28 days? Why do insurance companies only uh, you know, pay out based on that model? Why aren't we you know, giving people supports uh, after 28 days? Right? Why aren't they getting checkups? <laughs> kind of if I, if I had a heart attack today, I, my, my doctor, my cardio, I'm gonna, first of all, I'm gonna have a cardiologist, right, who deals with heart attacks. I'm gonna have regular checkups for probably a better part of two years. Um, there's gonna be supports for me. Uh, but with addiction, let's say I overdose today. I, you know, I get thrown into treatment. I'm not seeing a doctor after that, after I get out of treatment. I'll be lucky if I find housing, recovery housing. I'll be lucky if I find recovery supports. People in recovery, the difference for me was I had access, ample access to recovery housing that I stayed in for 18 months. You've got to have, housing has got to be a part of the continuum. People need to plug into solid recovery housing when they get out of treatment. Um, access to employment is another huge one. People have got to be able to get vocational skills. They have to be able to get access to employment. They have to be able to find some sort of purpose, uh, you know, moving forward. Community is another big one. We don't have funding, uh, ample funding for recovery community centers in this country. We don't have ample funding for authentic peer-to-peer -peer supports. Um, the conversation is always uh, focused on prevention, treatment, and then what, right? I mean, so we're missing the mark on that. Um, 
the second part of that answer is as a movement, I'll tell you, you know, to, to get these issues to the forefront, um, to provide support to local nonprofits and organizing uh, community and organizing groups that are that are helping to push this uh, issue forward and push the envelope in their communities. Um, I like to draw a lot of comparisons to the AIDS crisis in the 80s. We are missing funding. I mean, you know, you would think that public health crisis number one that's on the news every night would have, you know, uh, they, they'd open the floodgates of funding, private philanthropy, corporate philanthropy, uh, to help fund these efforts. Whereas cancer and diabetes and AIDS research raise billions of dollars a year. As a whole, this movement, the recovery movement, would be lucky to find 25 to 30 million dollars nationally. Um, and what we do with that 25 to 30 million dollars, and I'm talking about all groups across the country, not just facing addiction, I'm talking about all of them, all the small groups, the large groups, every single one of them. I think we do a lot of good work with that. But imagine if we had 500 million dollars. <laughs> I mean, we could turn this narrative up on its head overnight. We could get the funding that we need. So. A lot of that is stigma, a lot of that is cultural barriers, a lot of it takes the work of people like you and I to get to the tables of these philanthropists to tell our stories and convince them that this is an issue worth investing in. Um, and it is gonna take time, but I do believe we're getting there. Rightly or wrongly, and I'm not, again, judging because it's real easy to put a description on someone, but there are certain places in the country that have reputations for being um, more problematic with, with this issue. The state of West Virginia is one that gets a lot of attention. But um, Dayton, Ohio is, is another. It is a city that, that some have called the overdose capital of the world. Uh, you know, again, not disparaging Dayton. That's, that, 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 that sounds uh, terrible because I'm, I'm I'm sure the vast majority of the people that that is not reflective, but you were there. Mm -hmm. uh, you you went to Dayton. It there. Can you can you talk about the problem? Can you talk about? Are there lessons learned from Dayton that could be applicable or could be warnings uh, to other places? Sure. Um, so I got the opportunity to go to Dayton. It was actually two weeks ago. Um, and uh, it you know, changed me. Um, all I had heard about, I had never been, had never spent time in Dayton. All I had heard about Dayton was overdose capital of the nation, you know, highest per cap, I mean, it's true. Um, highest per capita overdoses than anywhere in the country, Montgomery County, uh, Ohio. Um, the images that I saw, you know, the New Yorker uh, came out with a full spread on it um, two weeks ago that showed people overdosing, it had pictures of mothers with caskets, it was all done in black and white. Um, pictures of people using in parks, um, you know, MSNBC did a special on it, and same, same story. I mean, kind of the train wreck story, opioid story, which has raised the bar of the national conversation to get us talking about it. Uh, but I wanted to go to Dayton for a different reason. Um, I had been hearing stories as an outcome of the Voices Project and the work we do at Facing Addiction of local organizations like community centers, churches, uh, schools that were doing some really phenomenal work um, in this space. And I didn't know what was going on there, but I had to get there to see it myself. So a woman, her name's Lauren White, uh, her brother's still struggling. She had called me up, she said, hey, Ryan, come to Dayton. Um, I own the, you know, I run a media company. Um, my brother's struggling. This is killing my community. I don't know what to do because I know nothing about this issue. All I know is my brother's having a hard time um, and he's in and out of treatment. And, uh, but I want to do something and I know how to make videos. So, you know, why don't we just team up and we'll figure it out? You know, I don't, I don't want any money for it. Like, I just want you to tell the Dayton story. I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll show up there and you can film it and we'll see how it turns out. We'll just figure it out as we go. Um, what I found though was a community that's incredibly resilient. Um, you know, for every bad story you hear coming out of Dayton, there are 50 good ones. Um, and 
being there on the ground, what I realized is how are people ever going to know what to do in their communities if the only story we're being fed is the problem, right? So while the problem story has helped to create dialogue and anger and incite some, some policymakers to start paying attention to this, now the dialogue is opening up. Okay, well now what do we do? Well, okay, well we're gonna shift money here, we're gonna shift money there. Um, I'll show you a clip, but we need to be putting money um, into peer-to-peer. -peer. We need to be putting money into these community centers. We need to be putting money into some of these clinics. We need to be putting money into some of these food banks. I went to Dayton and I, I mean, I try to consider myself a pretty well-read guy. The number one issue I heard out there right next to overdose was food access. These, these people that are out there, they, they don't have access to good food. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's breaking that generational cycle of poverty um, that people have been led to. How do they do that? They can do it through some innovative school programs like this Miracle Makers program I'll show you. Um, but it, it was the birth, that trip was the birth of Dayton Rising. It's a three-part series. Um, it's a collaboration between the community and the Voices Project. Uh, you know, it's sp spurred some other entrepreneurial ideas um, with this project. We're going to go do it in New Hampshire. Uh, we're going to do it in Las Vegas. We're going to do it in Detroit. Um, but again, these videos aren't just for like to have a nice video on social. It's to get people to pay attention that there is something we need to be looking at. Four days, a resilient community and an underground movement that is rising up. We're, we're one of the few inner urban cities that have hoop houses all over our neighborhood. So our kids that are coming in are trauma, kids that have had trauma and toxic stress associated with poverty. So we do do, all the teachers are trained in trauma-informed care and teaching. So mindfulness is a, um, a technique that gives kids tangible tools in which to cope with some of the stuff that's going on in their lives. Our place is we can say we're going to have two employees that are going to be, and we're, we're looking at hopefully maybe expanding. There's other places really interested now in what we're doing, where we go out and connect with the community where they are get them what they need, get them where they need to be. That's what hit home for me, is it's, it's an average family, it's just everyone. You know, how are you, how are you guys impacting and, and helping people get help? Well, primarily I work with, uh, with law enforcement here in Ohio, and a, as a representative of FOA, I get to work with uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration. You're recovery guys, so you yeah. get recovery. Yeah. That's why it's important yeah. to have yeah. recovery people at Doing the top yeah. leading the way, because so. we get it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And the compassion is automatically there. My visit to Dayton, Ohio, also known as the overdose capital of the nation, showed me what the media won't show you and i want to share it with the rest of america this is dayton rising well we've uh, we've run out of time and i know people have got to go back uh, for, but I want to conclude, and then everyone please come up and visit with Ryan if you have individual questions. But the final thing is, what can Little Rock do? What can we in Little Rock do to help or to prevent or just what can we do? Little Rock can do a lot. Uh, there's a lot of people who have reached out to me um, so far. The, the, the most important thing you can do, and it's a really personal decision, if you're impacted by addiction, if you're in recovery, if you're a family member, uh, when the time is right, tell your story, write an op-ed. Um, I, you know, we use this term in recovery, more will be revealed. It was for me and it will for you too. Um, you can also take it a step further. Whoever your congressperson is, whoever your state representative is, get a meeting with them and don't take no for an answer. You know, and don't think you have to have all the answers uh, before going into that meeting. Share your lived experience. If a place isn't made for you at the table, make a place for yourself. Um, and if that fails, build your own table. Um, and just be vocal. Um, get involved in your local recovery community organization. Um, reach out to me, reach out to Facing Addiction, help build a unified voice. Um, those are the most important things that led me on this journey. Well, it's an incredible journey. And uh, thank you for the great work uh, and the courageous work you are doing. Ladies and gentlemen, Ryan Hampton. <laughs>